Seventeen and a half million people. One third of all rural families are left behind in an age of technology and industrial progress. Families, some of them large families, make less than three thousand dollars a year. Whites, Negroes, American Indians, Spanish Americans, farmers, ex-farmers, handymen, former coal miners, timber workers, and road builders. Rural people struggling with poor housing, limited education, few employment opportunities, and little hope. Throughout America, regardless of race or heritage, they are trapped in a life they did not choose, a life they feel powerless to change. Well, you can watch them walk along the street. They're bent over with their arms crossed frequently, looking down, walking usually slowly. You don't see any quickness or brightness in their step. They just have a defeated look and a, a look of hopelessness. I just do labor work and got no education. And just labor work's all I have to hunt for. Well, there could be a whole lot done in the way of improvement. Yes, sir, it could stand a whole lot more improving than furnishing us. It's actually, it could stand some better than I used guy. Of course, I don't know where the man will have to make out if he don't get no better. He'll have to make out some way. These uh, six of us in the family, and I only draw $96 a month. $96 a month for six. Clothe them, send them to school. Yet we now know their lives can be changed. These people can join the rest of America in a life of fulfillment and plenty. But improvement can only come when all segments of the population join together in an effort dedicated to providing opportunities for these people. Not more welfare checks, but opportunity so they can use their own willingness and ability to become self-sufficient citizens. For example, it is difficult for a small farmer like this one to get along in the fast-moving world around him. His gross income for the previous year was $3,500. Out of that, $3,000 had to be put back into farming, leaving $500 for his own use. He and his wife struggled with no running water, no plow of their own, low-lying wet land and fields full of rocks. They have some cows, but no money for the right kind of feed. As a result, the cows cannot produce as well as they should, and the farmer's income drops still lower. His chosen way of life becomes more and more difficult to maintain. He is ambitious, proud of the farm buildings that he built himself, sorry to have to owe money for necessities, and distressed at the prospect of losing his farm. I know if I'd get the right amount to help, the assistance on this farm, I know I could make a go of it, could make ends meet, and. Uh, if I can't stay here, I would have to lose it. I, I surely wouldn't know what else to do because I've never done no other work in farming. I've been here all my life, and I sure would like to stay here. When farmers leave, it affects the entire area. At one time, there was large families living here. They made their living over the farm by farming the small fields. They raised their own vegetables and their own gardens. But it seems like that 
that is all gone. It, it slipped away from us. If we could help them just a little to live in these small communities and make a home here, we think it would be of great benefit to our cities and also our rural areas. The loss of this type of farm, the family farm, has been a, a, a great disaster to our particular part of the world here. It uh, has taken the people away from us. Our little communities, our towns have lost the trade and the business. Uh, the people have lost and the soil has lost. It's a losing proposition and our whole philosophy of life out here, the family farm, is being destroyed. Some communities are seeking ways to help the farmers and keep them on the land. We've had a demonstration farm program in connection with our work to help uh, improve on livestock and on uh, having better crops and in building up the soil and various forms of conservation. But we have moved more to the project method in order to suggest ways in which our people can at least supplement their income. One of the things that we are trying to do is to carry on work at our sorghum mill. Here people raise uh, cane and then bring it to the mill for processing. This is a project in which we have been able to get the people to take much of the initiative. We have provided some leadership, however, we have a full-time director of economic development in our program. The purpose of this project, this sorghum project, is to help the people of this area to help themselves. What we are really trying to do is to help really two classes of people, those farmers who would bring cane in to the mill, and also to help those who might be able to work here at the mill. One of the firm convictions that we do have about our mountain people is that they do want to help themselves if given an opportunity. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sorghum project, but we feel one of the most important things is that local communities organize themselves and attempt to work at helping themselves together rather than depending on someone else to come in from the outside and uh, furnish all their resources in terms of, of leadership and finances. It'll mean most when local communities can organize themselves and develop projects together. But industry is only part of the answer. Sometimes a relatively small improvement can mean the difference between success and failure. The most important thing is, in this valley of ours here, is the water. Without water, we cannot do anything. Every year, the people of this farming community put up a brush dam in an effort to get water for their crops. But every year, the dam washed away in the floods. Many people got discouraged, left their farms, and moved away. Those who remained refused to be defeated. This time, they worked with the state and federal governments and received technical help and some equipment. The people worked without any pay to build the new dam, and it has outlasted the floods. The dam you see behind us now is the most important thing for the people in this community and most, mostly because we made it with our own hands and the people are very proud because they've done the work themselves. Rural poverty involves more than the specific problems of farmers. Its effects are widespread. Children are especially hard hit. By nature, full of life, exuberant, eager to learn, children are crushed by poverty. Hunger, malnutrition, and disease often stifle these young lives before they have a chance to develop. They're undernourished, and malnourished, rather. They get worms. Now, it's a pitiful thing to say, but 80 out of 100 children in some of these schools have parasitosis, which means worms. It's common knowledge that uh, literally thousands of children go to school each day and go <clears throat> throughout the day with anything to eat because they do not have <clears throat> lunchroom money. 
Well, I would love to see them have a hot lunch for one thing. Now, up here at this school, uh, they don't have a hot lunch. They they uh, just open their stuff out of a can, you know, and pour it out in, in bowls, you know, just and eat it like that. The children entering this school cafeteria are like many others. They had no breakfast before leaving home. But this school found a way to give them a hot meal early in the morning. The cafeteria staff is paid by the regular school lunch program, and the extra food is provided by the federal government. As a result, the children no longer have fainting spells, nor do they sit through a long day of classes on an empty stomach. What about the child who comes from an inadequate home where he gets no encouragement from his parents, where he has, it doesn't have enough to wear, he doesn't have enough to eat, he comes to school hungry, he comes to school without having any experience in the past with books, anyone at home to help him, anyone at home to give him some motivation, where the whole attitude of the family is that of frustration and despair. We are hoping that in the daycare center, a demonstration research project, to give these children an opportunity to have the experiences, social and educational, to better prepare them for the first grade and later education. These children of this particular area, without this experience, would be spending most of their time in the homes which are not equipped to give them the type of advantages which we are at the daycare center. It is our hope that by giving these children preschool experience, they will be ready for learning when they do enter their first grade. The Meadowbrook Daycare Center has been in operation now a little over a year. We recognize the fact that a lot of our young boys and girls in the grammar grades were staying home to take care of children. So therefore we were interested in providing some type of supervised care for these children. Then another thing that we thought in terms of if we could get the daycare center started, it would mean for some people a gainful employment. Another thing that we were very concerned with was the fact that these children's parents would be able to work and they wouldn't have to worry about what's, what are their children doing at home. Another thing, the fact that other communities in their county are interested in trying to provide some type of supervised care for the children. I think the problem of basic education for our children is a critical one and one that we don't really see the total picture on. The schools can't do the whole job. The, the, with the kids in school, it gets pretty hard. Uh, when they run out of clothes, we have nine. And one is uh, my oldest boy uh, quit school last year. Uh, the last year, he didn't go to school. We did all we could. We talked to him. And my brother used to write to him and talk to him, and tell him. But I guess he just didn't want to go to school anymore. I, he, he said that... Uh, he never did have what the other, what he needed most of the time and that uh, when it got to where he had to pay for uh, those uh, current events and things like that, that uh, uh, all the other kids uh, would uh, pay for him. He was the only one that would uh, be without paying and it used to embarrass him and things like that. Well, maybe that's what actually got him to where he didn't even want to study anymore. I really don't know. We do occasionally have a few who cannot make, make out in the public school. They uh, are so far behind from not having attended school regularly in their own homes that they are too frustrated to learn in the public school. They, um, they feel they can't do it and they, as a result, their behavior is difficult and the teachers find it very difficult to teach them. Uh, for these children, we have a special class here on our campus where they can hopefully receive the kind of individual attention they can use to get a new attitude toward learning and an interest in learning which they haven't had before. These children at the present time are, are all teenagers working about on a third or fourth grade level. In the three weeks that I have worked with them, I've gotten to know, of course, more about them and can see what difference there is between a child here in the hills who has had a rough home environment to one who would be 
in another state or another area. I feel that just from work standards themselves, work habits and their attitude about them, their own selves, that they would be much different if they had had a good normal home upbringing. And I feel this very definitely in all three children, not really perhaps so much as Minnie and Jimmy. But Jimmy has possibilities and I feel is of normal intelligence, if not above. And I feel that he has a good mind when he wants to use it, but he's been defeated so many times in living, in expressing himself and in being in school that he just no longer has the desire to learn. Suppose that he does make the effort to learn and succeeds. What then? Will there be a job for him and for many others like him? We need help, work. That's all we ask, just a job. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to work. I'd like my husband to have a steady job and that way we could get along better. When industry and government work together, these people can be trained to work well in new jobs. Sequoia Carpet Mills became a dream in the minds of several of us. A dream that had a purpose. And that purpose was to provide the opportunity for employment for people such as these here in this room, who without this or other industrial opportunity would not have a job. There were many obstacles to overcome in the establishing of a new industry in an area that had never had any experience in textiles. All of the local people had to be trained, trained in jobs that are skilled, for we have no unskilled labor in our plant. This was accomplished through cooperation of the state and federal government in their various training programs. And we found that these people not only were anxious and willing, but in some instances learned faster than people who had grown up around textiles. We've had a lot of thrills in seeing these things come about. Our job isn't finished, uh, we've got a long, long ways to go. And I seriously doubt that our one little humble effort here could alleviate the poverty in the area because there's still a lot of people that need an opportunity. We have many, many applications on file right now. But such things as one Indian man who had several children, first week he was here, his wife had to come down and get the car from him so she could put the commodities uh, that she received. Uh, in the back of the car, the free gift from the rest of the working society to help them not starve to death. This is a program that I am sure is very beneficial, and we're not criticizing it at all, but a person receiving something without giving something in return does not have the self-respect that they need to really be a good American citizen. At our grand opening, we saw a little boy dash under the rope that we'd set out, and this boy's father had been the man that as had uh, given the keys to his car to get the commodities the first week he had been there. Well, this little boy, about four or five years old, ran under the rope and pointed at his father and said in a great big loud voice, that's my daddy. And all of us that knew the story of this particular man got tears in our eyes because that boy could not point with pride that that's my daddy there doing a good day's work and getting an honest day's pay for it. Even with a job, a man may have to return at night to a dilapidated, crowded shack where his incentive and determination can slowly ebb away. I think the most immediate and the most drastic need in this territory, especially in this county, is housing. The houses in this county, 99% of the residences are frame and they're from 20 to 35 to 40 years old. They have been patched and cobbled up until they're, they don't look too bad from the outside as you pass, but they actually fall into pieces. 95% of the homes have outside toilets, no water facilities. A few have water run into the house, and they simply pipe it out on the ground. Well, I've heard a lot of tales, like uh, so-and-so lives up in the Holland and have any running water and no lights and likes it. That's a bunch of Tommy rot. He doesn't like it. Would you like it? These people found a way to do something about it. With a government loan only sufficient to buy materials, this family set about repairing their house themselves. 
It is not an easy job after working a long day on their farm, but they are succeeding because of their powerful desire for something better. My husband and I were so worried about getting our house fixed for this winter. And then we started worrying how we would be able to to go on with the house. We didn't have any material to to work on it. And my husband couldn't do anything about it. He had to work to support the family. And while he was working, he couldn't do anything here. Well, anyway, we found out from somebody that we could that we could have a loan. So I talked with my husband and we finally decided to go and, and see about it. And I don't know what we, have, we had done with our home. We, it hadn't been for help for us and, and we hadn't had that loan. I put all this paneling and ceilings and plastering inside, outside. I guess by December I'm going to be ready with it. I hope so. So I do all my best in my house for my family to live better. This is only one family among millions. These people were fortunate enough to be able to get help. But such assistance should be available to all who need it. Massive programs must be launched. Programs that consider the fact that impoverished communities can contribute only a small part of the necessary funds. The people of each community must get to know each other understand each other, and finally, act together. It seems to me that this is what we've got to do. Any county that is really interested has got to bring together a good, strong basis of public support. Not only a few interested persons. There's got to be representation from the boards of county commissioners, from city governing boards, from all of the agencies that are concerned, schools, community colleges, industrial education centers, welfare and health agencies, employment service. And there's also got to be representation, uh, involvement, participation by leaders in the communities where the people li live that most need help. We've got to understand how these people look on life, what, they're, what they see as the barriers to their finding jobs, finding opportunities for themselves and their children. Hater's Gap, a mountain community in Washington County, Virginia. A community like many others, where a few men became concerned and anxious to do something for their town. The important thing was to unify the people who were scattered throughout the area. Seizing upon the idea of a community club, they held their first meeting a meeting that included about 70 members of the community itself and people from all the government branches in the county. One thing was stressed. Everyone had to be involved. To do this, they launched a number of programs, particularly in the field of recreation, baseball games in the afternoon and picnics in the evening. But money was needed for these projects. To raise it, they set up a lunch stand in a donated garage and rotating groups of volunteers from the community operated it on weekends. Now the community wanted to broaden the scope of its projects, involve the whole county, do more to help the people. To accomplish this, the director of the program wrote a letter asking for help. The letter arrived at the United States Department of Agriculture in Washington and almost immediately the townspeople had some help. They learned of the Office of Economic Opportunity and were able to present their plans. As a result, they received a grant of approximately $67,000 to develop programs to combat poverty in the county. One of the most successful of these is the Home Visitation Program. One young man, only 19 years old, works with high school dropouts and others. I meet them in the homes, on the streets, and in many particular places and peculiar places too. As I meet the dropouts and talk with them, gain their confidence, I try to persuade them to go to either technical school or back to high school maybe. In doing this, I take them to technical school, let them talk to authority there, and explain things. 
such as the classes, the courses, how long to last and the cost and so on and so forth. And with this, this they become interested in this. And so eventually they will enroll in the technical school and take a trade and become specialized in this. Another thing that I'm particularly interested in is the illiterate people, especially the young illiterate people. In this rural area of ours, there are many that can't read or write, and without this, they are just lost. Therefore, I spend a great deal of time and put forth a little more effort each day to help these people to learn this, reading and writing, so as they can go to school and take their place in this everyday world. Another worker in the home visitation program is a woman who is moving around the community with an intelligent attitude, presenting the programs in a new way to the people she meets. As I have gone into the homes of these underprivileged people and talked with them about their problems and explained our program to them, it is amazing to see the expression on their expressions on their faces. Some believe, some say, this is too good to be true, while others say, when did this happen? Where can I go to apply for this program? In explaining this program to the people, I always emphasize the fact that one must get himself qualified in order to get and hold a job. We are having group meetings in order to open doors and decide where our future is going to be. I am hoping that our county can be surveyed in terms of better job opportunities and employment needs for qualified people. Washington County is one example of a community in action. The federal government stands ready to help all rural communities in their fight against poverty. But the communities themselves must take the initiative, organize and prepare programs to eradicate poverty. The framework and the means exist for a creative partnership between government and local leadership. They exist in the Economic Opportunity Act, in programs of the United States Department of Agriculture, and in the services of other federal and state agencies. Now it is up to local leaders to act. A start has been made. Much more remains to be done. It is said that the poor will always be with us. But who knows what man may accomplish when his goals are high and his determination unfailing. Thank you.